Do I have to do anything? I see continue. Do I have to do continue? I see that this meeting is being recorded. Yes, you have I to, have to do both. Oh, sorry, I have to uh, agree. Okay, fine. So we're live. You're on mute, Monica. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Geneva Trade and Development Workshop, jointly organized by the CEPR, the Geneva School of Economics and Management, the Graduate Institute Geneva, UNCTAD, and the WTO. For today's seminar, I'm delighted to introduce Paula Conconi from the Université Libre de Bruxelles, who will present trade protection along supply chains. Uh, just a quick reminder of the seminar format. So the presentation will last one hour and will be followed by a 15 minutes uh, session of uh, Q&A. Uh, during the presentation, please feel free to ask uh, clarifying questions in the Q&A window. Uh, with the help of my co-hosting colleagues, I will try to relay them uh, to Paola. Uh, today, we are also very lucky uh, to have Axel Erbahar, uh, who is a co-author on the paper, to join us uh, and so he will be able, able to uh, help us uh, answering uh, your questions. So without further ado, Paula, the floor is yours. You have one hour. Thanks a lot. Let me share my screen. So tell me if you see one second, view, full screen. Wait, view, full screen mode, so should work. Do you see the slide changing? Yeah? Yes. Okay, cool. So thanks a lot for the invitation. And uh, indeed, this is joint work with Axel, who is following the seminar, and he can, you know, already answer some of the clarifying questions along the way. So feel free to ask. And also with Chad Brown and Lorenzo Trimarchi. And it's a paper about trade policy and supply chains. And in the broad motivation for our project is the rise of China as a world trading power. In the last few decades, China has gone from being a very small player, it was accounted for less than 2% of world exports in 1990, to be now the top exporter since several years. And, uh, and many studies have been written, many influential studies like the author Doran Ansel and follow-up papers on the impact of this rise on uh, employment in particular in the US. So the so-called China shock and China or China syndrome literature. More recently, China has also been the focus of a, of a literature that, is, that has looked at the effects of uh, tariffs, and in particular, the 2018 tariffs introduced by President Trump on various outcomes, prices and uh, welfare, etc. So this is a very vibrant literature, including, for example, the paper entitled Return to Protection on QJE uh, and, and other papers like Amiti et al. And so these papers have focused on uh, protection against China, but somehow have uh, both this literature have disregarded the fact that China has been for a long time uh, the target of US protection. So a lot of these papers on the 2018 Trump's tariff have sort of talked about this return to protection as if uh, there had been no protection before Trump. But when you look at uh, the measures that the US at uh, enforce against China well before President Trump uh, took office, you see that, the, you know, that the China had already been the target of increasing US protection. The picture, this picture actually says it all. So if you look at between 88, which was the beginning of President Bush senior presidency and uh, you know, Obama II, 2016, uh, anti-dumping duties, which are by far the most widely used protectionist measures, protectionist measure of the US and other countries, more than tripled, uh, you know, went, uh, what was it, between, you know, increased between four, 45% in 88 to, you know, almost 150%. This is average US anti-dumping duties against China. And what you see here in red is the further increase in anti-dumping protection of the US against China under Trump. So this is just to say that it was well before Trump, there was already a lot of action in terms of anti-dumping duties in particular uh, against uh, China. 
Uh, and so on top of the rise of China, uh, another important trend of the last few decades has, of course, been the emergence of global supply chains, of global value chains, uh, resulting partly from the ITC revolution and you know, falling transport costs. All of this has led to uh, the fragmentation of production processes across countries. And what um, Chad in a recent piece has pointed out is that, is that a lot of the protection that the US and other countries have applied in the last few decades has actually been targeted to intermediate goods, to key inputs. So then the question uh, that we want to address in this paper is what, is the, what are the effects of protection on, you know, if you put protection like anti-dumping duties on key intermediate inputs, how are the effects going to propagate along supply chains? There's a lot of, uh, so you can find a lot of media, quotes in the media about the negative effects of protection along supply chain. This is a quote from an article on The Economist in which the CEO of the US vice, you know, the Bicycle Corporation of America complains about tires on key inputs, by components, steel and aluminum, and say, you know, due to these tires on key inputs, we are, uh, this is costing American jobs because we are putting plans to expand on hold. So the key goal of our paper is to actually provide systematic evidence for these negative effects. So what we want to do is exploit, you know, what we do is collect very detailed information on all protectionist measures applied by the US uh, since the 1980s, uh, and in particular with a focus on China, but not only, and, and combine this information on uh, protectionist measures with detailed input-output tables to study the effect of protection along supply chains. When looking at the effects of tariffs on any outcome, of course, the key challenge is to, to deal, you know, that we have to deal with is the endogeneity of tariffs or any trade policy. And, and so one of them, I, I guess the first contribution of our paper is to provide a new instrument uh, for anti-dumping protection, which, as you will see, combines exogenous variation on the political, in the political importance of industry over time, coming from swing state politics, and also variation in the uh, experience of different industries in anti-dumping proceedings. Of course, I will explain in detail this instrument because this is a key as I said, contribution of our paper that allow us to deal with, uh, you know, concerns about the endogeneity of protection. Once we, uh, I will hopefully have convinced you of this instrument, the second part of the paper uses this instrument to study the effects of protection along supply chains. And what I'll show you is that we find significant and sizable negative effects of protection for downstream industries both in terms of employment, but also wages, sales, investment, various outcomes. So producers in downstream industries like the bicycle uh, industry that I was mentioning before, uh, suffer along many dimensions. You have uh, the growth rate of employment is, uh, is hindered, but also the growth rate of wages, sales, and investment. And I'll also show you that, so what we also explore is the mechanism for these negative effects. And I'll show you that, as you would expect, uh, protection, so import tariffs, re reduce imports and raise production costs. And this is the mechanism to which they uh, hurt downstream producers. And what I'll show you is that the overall uh, losses of these protection, even when you take into account uh, the effects on, uh, on the protected industries, you get a very sizable overall loss in terms of employment growth uh, due to uh, input protection. Uh, okay, so let me very, very briefly mention the various streams of literature that we are related to. So these are the first, you know, the, the, these are the literature related to China. So the China shock literature and the you know, literature on the US-China trade war that I was mentioning in the first slide. So what I want to point out is that so the, the China shock literature has really ignored uh, protection. So author Don and Ansa, but also uh, Pierce and Schott, all these studies have sort of assumed away the use of trade policy where, while 
as I showed you, and as you'll see in the paper, there's been a lot of action in terms of US trade policy vis-a-vis -vis China, and that's what we are, uh, what we are, so we are going to show you that, you know, so their focus is on the employment effects of trade with China. I'm gonna, you know, in our paper, the main focus is on the employment effect of protection uh, applied to trade with China. Um, here is, you know, the literature on trade policy and vertical linkages to which uh, also some of you have contributed. And also here is the Grossman and Hellman paper, which I think was presented in the last seminar, Geneva uh, workshop last month. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of studies that, is, that have looked at the effects of trade policy along supply chains, including some of my previous work. This is the first paper to study the effects of anti-dumping protection, which as I said, is by far the most widely used protectionist measure on supply chains and to provide an instrument for anti-dumping protection. And this is, you know, a series of papers. And again, it's by no means, a, you know, there's more than these, uh, these are only examples of some of the papers that have looked at uh, anti-dumping protection causes and consequences. And some of and our instrument builds, as I'll explain on some of these papers. Okay, so let me, uh, if there are no questions, you know, feel free, as I'm, as I told the organizers, I'm also happy to take questions along the way, not only at the end, so feel free, if you can, to interrupt, maybe uh, not everyone can, but, you know, uh, feel free to interrupt if you can, or to ask questions uh, in the chat. So th there is one question from Marcelo, actually, Paula. So oh, yeah. He's asking whether uh, the increase in protection couldn't be uh, actually welfare increasing, uh, given the tariff escalation on fine, given the high tariffs on our final goods, so via a general equilibrium effect. Sorry, given the tariff, given that there are high tariffs on final goods, the the increase in tariffs on intermediate inputs, whether it wouldn't be whether it couldn't be welfare improving. So I have to think about it. Maybe this is a question we can discuss at the end. I think actually, Terry. So what what you have is that most of the protection, at least in terms of anti-dumping, is actually not on final goods. It's actually on intermediate, like steel, chemicals, and other products. So the argument that you know you you have already high protection on final good. So at least when you look at temporary trade barriers or anti-dumping, countervailing duty safeguards, you don't see this pattern of final goods being more protected. You actually see that it's key intermediate inputs that are uh, the target. But maybe we can postpone uh, this is for a debate at the end. We are not looking at welfare. We are mostly looking at employment in line with the China syndrome uh, literature. And I'm gonna show you that, you know, protection increases prices of, of targeted products, decreases imports, and reduces employment. You know, it has net negative effects on employment if you put together the protected industries and, they, and those that use the protected inputs. But you know, we are not looking at welfare, and, and maybe that's you know, more the focus is already a very thick paper. But I, in any case, the you don't see high protection of final goods, actually, when it comes to anti-dumping keys. Um, okay, so unless there's other, there is any other question on the you know, introduction, let me tell you about the data we, we are using. So the main data set when it comes uh, for, for tariffs and for anti-dumping in particular is the temporary trade barrier database that Chad, uh, put together when it was at the World Bank, actually with the, together with Axel. So this is a database that was then discontinued by the bank in 2014 when Chad left, but uh, we have basically you know, updated it. So we have information on US anti-dumping duties as well as uh, uh, countervailing duties and safeguards, but also for, I think it's not just the US, but it's the most important countries, I think it's 30 countries, from the 1980s till today. So it's up to today. Um, the main focus of the paper is on anti-dumping duties because these are, as I said, the, the most widely used protectionist measures. And in robustness check, we also uh, 
take into account other protectionist measures such as, such as countervailing duties or um, safeguards or MFN, although they don't change much over our sample period. But the main focus is on the anti-dumping protection and the main focus is also on China as the target country. And in robustness check, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you results where we look at all target countries. But most of the action in this period has been anti-dumping protection against China. China has been, I think, I forgot now exactly, but I think it, it accounts for 70%, if not more, of cases since China at least joined the WTO, it is by far the biggest target of US protection. So what we have to do, of course, is, you know, this data is very detailed and it's uh, at the HS10 level. So you, you go, it's really at the product level. But of course, we are interested in looking at the effects of protection on various outcomes in downstream industries, such as, you know, is the idea that, you know, we are, we are interested in uh, looking at employment and other outcomes for producers who are downstream and we, we have to go from data that is at the product level to data that is at the industry level. So what we have to do is map each anti-dumping measure, each anti-dumping case to a SIG4 digit sector so that we can then merge with data on employment at the SIG digit from the 80s on, you know, um, but also, you know, investment, etc. So there's a lot of concordance issues that are, of course, de detailed in the paper. Um, although the main focus is, as I said, on anti-dumping, we have collected, and we I'll show you results in which we use, uh, you know, other protectionist measures. Um, all uh, so the main focus is also the uh, so in terms of sample period we focus on the 88-2016 period as our main uh, sample period. So these are the eight complete presidency for which we have data. I'm going to show you results in which we also include Trump, uh, results that include measures introduced under Trump, but for that we don't yet have all uh, the employment and other variables. Uh, okay, so what about, so in order, so this is gonna be to measure protection on the industry level. And then we need to measure input upper linkages. We need to identify vertically related industries and we do so using uh, input upper tables from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the BAA, which is extremely, so the BAA tables are extremely disaggregated and that's a key advantage compared to say, uh, the world input output table. So you have 479 industries, both including both manufacturing and non-manufacturing. And, and this is the, the tables that are also used by various studies that look at uh, uh, vertical linkages, like Asimoglu et al. This is the paper that studies the effect of trade with China on employment in in, uh, in exposed industry and vertically related industry. Here we are looking at the effects of protection on China on vertically related industry. And like Asimov et al, we use the 1992 BAA input output tables. So we fixed, if you want, technology at the beginning of the sample period. So here we are following, if you want, the literature and uh, the, what you see, of course, when you look at input output coefficients is that they are, uh, the distribution of IO coefficient is very skewed with some inputs playing a very important role. For example, steel uh, is the key input for I think over 15% of final good industry. So there are some inputs that are much more important than others. So we are going to take into account of course the heterogeneity of, uh, of these inputs by um, measuring protection, so weighting uh, the input tariffs with the input up, the cost share, the omega ijs, which are going to be simply the input output coefficients. I think in our main measure of, in our baseline regressions, I'm going to use measures of input protection that are using the direct requirement coefficients, and I'm going to show you robustness checks in which we look at total requirement coefficients. But in any case, what we have is a main uh, measure of protection. Uh, 
So if you look at an industry, a downstream industry, J, think about the car industry or the bicycle industry in the example from the economist that I was mentioning at the beginning, you're going to look at all the inputs I necessary to make J uh, as, as uh, captured by the input output tables. And you're going to look at the protectionist measures. So the anti-dumping duties apply to each input industry I and use the cost shares um, to create the average. Um, importantly, so one thing I want to uh, emphasize is that in our baseline regression, we exclude the diagonal, the omega JJs. And I'll explain to you later why we do so. So we are not, you know, in, as you know, in input output tables, the, the diagonal is quite important. So you, to make cars, you use cars. To make steel, you use steel. Particularly when it comes to, you know, at the SIG4 level, the diagonal is quite important. So, however, when you look at the, uh, when you include the diagonal, you're sort of mixing up the level of protection on your final good and the level of protection on input because a SIG4 industry includes uh, final good producers uh, that are protected as well as producers who use protect, you know, inputs that are protected. So in the main measure of, uh, in our main regression, and we are going to use a measure of input tariff that excludes the diagonal, that only looks at, uh, you know, when looking at protection on cars, we look at all uh, the input uh, necessary to make a car, excluding car itself. So as a SIG4 industry. Uh, so that I'm gonna show you, as I said, an exercise where we do include the diagonal and there we are going to account for uh, the effects on the protected industry. Okay, so on top of uh, data on tariffs and data on input output coefficients to identify vertically related industries and measure input protection, we need various data sets. We, we, need, uh, we use various data sets to uh, to look at the outcome of interest. So when it comes Paula, to- Paula, sorry yeah. for interrupting. Just before you move to the other uh, data sources. Yes. Uh, I have a question from uh, Fariha Kamal and then uh, Marcelo also added uh, to that question. Whether you could clarify how foreign firm specific versus sector, sector specific anti diping tariffs are handled in the data. And Marcelo is asking particularly about the bilateral di dimension. So the anti-dumping is on some firms in some countries, whereas employment wages is not uh, bilateral. Okay, so yeah, we are using, um, in our baseline regression, we are using the all others duty uh, applied to China. Uh, you can use, and you'll get the same results, the average duty applied to Chinese producers. The two are highly correlated. I think the correlated is 0 0.85. This is for Kamanas. Uh, when it comes to bilateral, of course, employment is not bilateral. So what, we are, what I'm going to show you is that, uh, Marcelo, is that, so first of all, we are playing now one of the many things, and I should have said that from the beginning, this is very much an ongoing project. We are now incorporating several interesting comments we received at LSE and in other recent presentation, like at the ITC. So we, one of the things we are doing is also to, uh, construct measures of uh, input protection that account for the importance of China in US imports. Of course, you have to use, you know, it's tricky because tariffs affect imports, so you have to uh, to choose which import penetration ratio. But anyway, I'm going to show, uh, we have, this is a baseline measure. Uh, I'm going to show you some robustness check where we use alternative measures, and we are still playing with it. Uh, what I'm going to show you, nevertheless, is that uh, although, so you're right, of course, protection is bilateral. So, you, you know, the U.S. may apply, you know, U.S. tariffs on steel from China. What I'm going to show you is that this increases uh, the um, prices, uh, not only on, uh, of, uh, of targeted goods from China, but also domestic prices in China. So even if you, even though in, you're right, Marcelo, that the protectionist measure is bilateral, by, you know, if you apply ties on China, you're going to increase 
domestic prices of the targeted products, and you're going to uh, therefore affect um, employment, so production costs and employment independently of whether, even if producers who are sourcing inputs domestically are going to experience an increase in uh, production cost. I don't know if I'm answering this you know, question. Again, we can also debate more alternative measures uh, of protection. We have several others that I'm going to, to show you, but we are still playing with this and how to, to you know, which, which should be our baseline. Right now, this is our baseline and we have several uh, alternative measures of protection as robustness, as I'll show you. Okay, so... Um, While you are still on, on this yes. slide mentioning the diagonal, uh, Laszlo Halpern is asking what is the variation in the share of diagonal across industries? I don't have this on the top of my head. Maybe Axel can compute these and, and put it in the Q&A. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. I know that, you know, if you look, the you know, the diagonal is, so the Omega JJs are, are positive for most SIG4 industries. Uh, but uh, I don't know the answer to that question. So maybe, you know, Axel can compute it while I keep, uh, I keep going. Uh, okay, so let me try to move on. So these are the standard data sets that we use for the outcome variable. So like Autodon and Anso, Asimoglu et al, in order to look at employment at the industry level, at the SIG4 level, we'll use CBP, country business patterns. We also, when we look at the effects of protection on, on, on imports, we look at UN contract, we use US, UN contract. For the effects on prices, we use the BLS, the Bureau of Labor, of Labor Statistics. And we also use the NBR uh, CES database for other outcome variables like sales and investment. Notice that when when we look at employment, the CBP provides employment data for all industries, all industries in the economy, including non-manufacturing industries like construction or other services. The CES database for which we can get sales and investment is only manufacturing. So when we look at other outcomes beyond employment, we are restricted to looking at manufacturing. Um, right. So let's move to you know, the key identification challenge. So the broad concern, of course, in studying the effects of protection along supply chains is the endogeneity of trade policy, as I mentioned before. In particular, in our context, the key concern is omitted variables that could be correlated both with the extent of input protection and the performance of downstream producers. And there are several uh, of these possible omitted variables. One example is productivity shocks. There would be, uh, you know, if you think about Chinese, for example, suppliers experiencing a positive productivity shock, this would lead to uh, an increase in US imports of those uh, inputs, so which could, can increase input protection because you can more easily pass the injury test. So you would have a productivity shock uh, abroad in same China that is positively correlated with input protection. And at the same time, it's likely to be positively correlated with downstream performance because US downstream producers are gonna benefit from the positive supply shock in China. So if there is a, you know, this kind of omitted variable would give rise to a correlation between you know, performance, employment, or other measures of performance downstream and input protection, making it harder to identify a negative effect of input protection along supply chains. And there are other uh, potential omitted variables that we discuss in the paper that would have similar effects, making it harder to identify these negative effects. One of them is lobbying, and here is uh, you know, this is the paper that Marcelo wrote with Gavan and other co-authors on the Ristat. Uh, and Ana Maria Maida has also uh, done work on this. So there is a lot of uh, there's evidence, systematic evidence that uh, downstream producers try to lobby against input protection. And in fact, uh, Marcelo and his co-authors provide an example of Ford and GM and other uh, 
car producers who managed to block some anti-dumping duties on steel, I think in 2004, because obviously this was detrimental to them and they uh, lobbying against it and successfully blocked in this case anti-dumping protection. So if you, if you have that um, producers downstream lobby against input protection, particularly if they are declining, then again, you will have an omitted variable that makes it harder to identify negative effect of input protection on uh, downstream performance. So you do need to worry about the endogeneity of uh, protection. And in fact, what I'm going to show you is that when you run simple OLS regression, so ignoring the endogeneity of trade policy, you can hardly observe, you know, you, you usually get negative effects but they're not significant, not systematically so, and very small. And it's only once you instrument for trade policy that you actually can see how downstream industries are, you know, significantly um, and sizably affected by uh, protection. So what is our strategy? What is our instrument? Our instrument is the interaction between two variables, which I'm going to describe in details in the next slide. It's basically, so uh, it's the interaction between, let me put the whole slide, between this variable swing IT, which is varying at the industry term level. So this is a presidential term. And uh, this variable anti-dumping experience, which is instead varying at the industry level. So what is the logic of our instrument is that anti-dumping protection should be skewed in favor of industries that are important in states that are classified as swing during a presidential term as captured by this variable swing, but only if these industries are, if you want, able to exploit this political advantage because they have knowledge of the complex anti-dumping proceedings. And so this is captured by this experience measure, which is, so let me start by explaining first the experience measure. So what is the logic of why, so why should anti-dumping anti experience matter for anti-dumping protection? So here we build on um, several papers by Bruce Bloning, including his AER in 2004 with Park, in which he points out that, uh, experience matters for anti-dumping because uh, the proceedings to, you know, in order to get protection, an industry has to petition and petitioning involves, you know, providing a lot of information about the case, uh, legal analysis, it's extremely complex. I mean, we have a long footnote in the paper that provides, you know, that gives you an idea of the extent to which you know, the amount of information that a petitioning a party needs to provide, and not only the information, but the legal analysis. So what uh, Bruce argues is that because of this complexity, prior experience really matters, because it both decreases the cost of filing cases. If you have experience, it's easier, it's less costly to file new cases, but also increases the likelihood that if you petition, you'll be successful at getting protection. So what we do, is uh, we measure in historical experience uh, of uh, an industry I by looking at the number of petitions uh, pre sample so in the 80, 87 period. And our main sample period starts in 88. And, in, and uh, indeed, if you look at this experience, it is positively correlated, predicts petitions in our sample period. Uh, I think in terms of descriptive statistics, 40% of industry filed in the 80s, you have a lot of industries in manufacturing, in tradable industry that didn't file in the 80s, partly because they were, they didn't need to. They were not subject to a lot of protection. At the time, you know, the main uh, competition was with Japan. A lot of industries were covered by uh, some other measures of protection like uh, the MFA, the multi-fiber agreement. So there is variation in the extent to which in the industries acquired anti-dumping experience in the 80s, and this is going to be um, driving the variation in the measure of experience. The second part of our instrument is instead um, capturing the, it's time varying, is this variable swing IT, 
And, uh, and it's basically the motivation or the key idea is that uh, in the US, um, you, you know, industries that are important in swing states should be, should get, uh, you know, should be, so politicians should have stronger incentives to protect industries that are important in swing states. So there is already a series of papers and I've written a paper myself with Lorenzo and others uh, showing that various type of US trade policies like, uh, you know, this, this paper by Mirabel. Uh, so this is a key Canadian journal paper that shows, I think uses uh, US coverage duration in the eighties and points out the swing state policy explains that even the paper by Fabelgam and Coates, the recent QJE, shows that Trump's tariffs in 2018 were actually skewed in favor of counties that were in swing states, swing counties. So what we, the idea of our paper is that uh, in general, politicians can use or use trade policy to try to get votes in states that are the battleground state, the swing states, as you all know, the US electoral system creates an incentive to favor swing states, to sort of ignore states that are safe, where you're gonna anyway win the electors for the presidential election and target and, and give favors to, um, to states that are uh, where uh, you are not safe. So the, where these are battleground states where it's not clear which of the two parties will, will uh, win. So what, how we, do we define swing states? Here we follow in our main definition, and we, I'll show you there is a robustness. We use the standard definition, which is uh, a state is classified as swing in, uh, during a presidential term T. If uh, the difference in vote shares between the Democratic and Republican candidates in the previous presidential election is less than 5%. So if this was, if the out, it's based on the outcome of the previous presidential election, and if the threshold, if the threshold use is five percent, and I'm going to show you robustness, as I said, uh, in which we change the threshold, or we look at the not at the a retrospective definition, but a forward-looking definition. But here, this is the standard definition that, for example, McLaren and others have used. Also, the QJE paper I was mentioning. So if you apply this definition, so less than 5% vote difference in previous presidential election, these are the maps of states that are classified as swing during the last eight, based on the last eight presidential elections. So we should probably now add another map uh, with the most recent presidential election. So as you can see, there is variation, important variation, both in the number of states that are classified as swing, they are the battleground states that you want to win, as well as the identity, which states are swing. You know, there are some states, even California, at the beginning, there's one term in which California is swing. Sometimes, uh, you know, Ohio is swing several times, but not all the time, Pennsylvania. So there, is, there are changes in the identity of swing states, and these are what actually drive our identification. So our measure of our, so this was the definition of swing state, our definition of swing industry, swing IT, is basically the political importance of an industry during a term T, and that is measured as the um, number of workers. So an in industry I, the political importance of the industry in the term T, is the total number of workers employed in that industry in states that are classified as swing during that term T. So the key variation, so if you want to, is uh, there is a shock every four years and that's the, uh, every presidential election leads to a new identity. You know, there are some states that are narrowly where the difference in vote share is narrow, less than 5%. And this is if you want the political shock, they make some states uh, politically important, and uh, and and so that's the sh the shifter, the political shock, and then you have an exposure to this political shock that is different across industries, depending on the importance of the industry across states, and how do we measure the the importance of industry in different states? 
we use the initial employment shares so at the beginning of our sample periods. So we use, in, you know, employment share of industry I in each state uh, S from 1988. Um, so this is going to be, you know, if you want to shift, you know, at the idea we actually rewriting now our paper following, you know, interesting conversation with uh, Kirill Boryzak and his co-authors, trying to actually spell out a bit more that our instrument is really a shift share. So you have the, the shift is really the political shock every four years, every, you know, with every presidential election. And then the shares are basically coming from the variation in employment shares across states, as well as the uh, experience of different industry at, in anti-dumping proceedings. Okay, so uh, why should why should Laura, sorry for interrupting yeah. just before you move on I have a few questions on, yeah. the, on your instrument or variable yeah uh, so first my question uh, clarifying question that I have is uh, on your so on the swing states so you said you define them as those that were uh, swing in the previous uh, in the previous election yeah. So the idea is that uh, the candidates make some promises and then the protection is a reward to how, how the states were, uh, how the voting went into in the swing state after the election. Uh, the idea is that politicians are retrospective and they look at which, so based on the previous elections, they, they think that they identify the states that are closed and they then put pressure here is actually related to the, the slide I'm going to present next. They somehow put pressure on the key institution that decide on anti-dumping and during the terms of following the, the election use anti-dumping to try to favor key industry in those states that are swing. So it's as if politicians are somehow retrospective, they, they look back at this. So if you're looking today, you know, you would look at the uh, 2020, November 2020 election, look at those states that were swinging, and there were many in the last presidential election, including states that have not been swinging in recent years, and you try to, uh, you know, and these are the states you want to favor. So we, of course, this is somewhat my, it's, it's myopic, it's actually quite conservative because it doesn't allow politicians to get new information. Uh, but, you know, but we use this standard definition because A, it, so it's, so this is, you know, it's basically extremely unlikely, it's impossible to, you know, hard to believe that the previous election determining, so that anti-dumping during the term affects previous electoral outcomes. So the main reason why we use the retrospective definition is to, you know, endogeneity of the political shock. So anti-dumping during this term, it, you know, Biden term cannot affect the 2020, November 2020 presidential outcomes. In one of the robustness, I'm going to show you that we, you know, you can think that politicians have more information during their term about which states will be swing in the next election. So we look at the forward definition at the end of the term and we get actually results, you know, qualitatively similar results. But if you want, our definition is the standard one are based on the definition and is also the most conservative. So based on this definition, uh, we then, uh, we look at the mechanism, if you want. So we have an appendix in the paper because this is, you know, which, which we may actually expand further in which we provide micro evidence that actually swing state politics matters for anti-dumping politics. So what do we do? We collected, first of all, information on the composition uh, since the 80s of the two key uh, congressional committees that decide on trade policy. Uh, and these are the Finance Committee in the Senate and the Ways and Means Committee in the House. And if you look at the, this committee and who are members, the key, the new members of these committees are, uh, you know, so the, the states that are classified as swing during the term are overrepresented in these key trade committees. On top of it, and more importantly, what we have done is uh, look at actual decisions of uh, ITC commissioners who are 
key players when it comes to determining anti-dumping duties, and we have looked at whether their decisions on anti-dumping are affected by the political importance of industry in swing states as proxy by our swing state measure. And what we find is that, so these are our regressions. We have actually used data from one of our previous, uh, you know, PhD students, Aquilante, Tomas Aquilante who is now at the Bank of England. And he's, in his job market paper, he had collected all the uh, votes from the 80s of ITC commissioners. So, every, you know, the ITC is with the Department of Commerce, one of the key institutions in the US determining anti-dumping protection. And, and uh, for every petition you have, so if, if an industry petitions for anti-dumping, say steel petitions for anti-dumping against China today, then uh, you know, the DOC has to make a decision, so the Department of Commerce has to first make a decision on dumping. And then at the end, you have the decision of ITC commissioner on injury. And these are uh, the votes of the six commissioners on each petition, on each case. And as you can see, so even when you put commissioner fixed effects, so you know, you're really exploiting variation within commissioner across cases, you see that it, whether a commissioner uh, supports the a petition, so you know, decides for anti-dumping uh, in, so in favor of the petitioning industry is, uh, uh, is clearly, you know, it's, there's a strong positive correlation with the importance of that industry in swing state with the swing IT variable. And the same is true if you look at not an individual commissioner's vote, but the share of ITC commissioner who votes in favor. So all of this provides new evidence, I think, which, you know, you know, is building on previous work. There's this AER from 82, for example, that already has shown that anti-dumping protection is the most important, you know, Anti-dumping is the most important protection is measure and it's extremely political. It's not meant to be political. It's meant to be somehow delegated to the to, to institutions like the DOC and the ITC and not congressmen. But already we know from previous studies that politicians, members in particular, the Finance and Ways and Means Committee, put a lot of pressure on these uh, institutions and can influence uh, trade policy decisions. And what we show is that swing state politics in particular can have an impact on, uh, on anti-dumping duty. So, and this is, so this provides some sort of, let me go back. So this is to, uh, to support the key idea of, uh, you know, behind our instrument that, that basically we should see that in, so the, the logic of our instrument is within a term, industry that should get more you know, protection should be skewed in favor of industries that are important in swing states, particularly if they have the experience to exploit this political importance. So experience is also important because you have, for example, in a sample period, industry like navigation equipment that are high in some terms, in terms of their swing state measure, swing industry measure, so they are politically important, but they never filed for anti-dumping before. And so you don't, and they are not protected at all. So it's the combination of uh, the political importance coming from swing state politics and the uh, historical experience in anti-dumping proceedings that helps you to really predict uh, anti-dumping protection. So what I'm going to show you next is that this instrument, which is the interaction between the swing IT measure and the experience is pre-sample experience of the industry in anti-dumping proceedings, does a good job at predicting uh, the level of anti-dumping protection granted to an industry I during a particular term T. Controlling for industry fixed effects and term fixed effects. So really exploiting variation in the political importance of these industries over time. So when you, when you run this simple regression, this is a simple OLS regression, you can see that you know the instrument does you know is a strong predictor so here we are you know let's go back one second we are predicting the level of anti-dumping duty so the average anti-dumping duty on imports from china in industry i seek for industry i during term t as a function of our uh, instrument which is the interaction between swing it and experience experience 
is, is uh, not varying over time, so is absorbed by the SIG4 fixed effects. But uh, what you can see is that the coefficient of IV is positive and significant. When you try to put just swingness, not interacted with the experience, it is the coefficient is positive but not significant, showing that per se political importance is not enough to get, you know, in order to get protection, you need to bo have both, you know, to be important in, in states that are classified as swing during the term, but also to, uh, to have this experience uh, in anti-dumping proceedings. So what I'm going to show you next is now this, you know, this is, if you want our baseline measure of anti-dumping protection, you can then play around with alternative measure of anti-dumping, not the, the average anti-dumping duty, apply to an industry I, but you can look at the product coverage, uh, import coverage, you can go beyond anti-dumping and include countervailing duties and safeguards. You can look beyond China and look at all countries. You can exclude steel, which is the most targeted, uh, the sector that is uh, most targeted. Uh, you can also play around with different definition of swing states weighting the states by the number of electoral votes using a different threshold, not the standard 5%, but you can try with, for example, a higher threshold. You can look at not the retrospective definition of swing states, but a forward looking definition of swing states. And, and you know, there's more that we do. So all in general, so overall to all these robustness, you know, we find that our instrument, the interaction between the political importance of the industry in states that are swing during a particular term and the historical experience in anti-dumping proceedings does a very, you know, is a very strong predictor of the level of protection granted to uh, ASIC for industry. And so then, you know, how much time do I have, Monica? Because I'm, I, I just nine, have a sense. About nine, 10 minutes. Okay, so then I'm gonna skip the placebos. I'm just gonna mention that we run these placebo exercises. Basically the logic of these placebo exercises is to, to say, okay, can we still do a very a, a good job of predicting anti-dumping protection if instead of using the actual swing states that are, you know, the identity information on the identity of states that are actual swing uh, actually swing in a particular term, we randomize the identity swing state in different ways. And the answer is no, we cannot predict. Basically, this is the coefficient, the positive and significant coefficient in, in our previous regression. So we, there we do a good job of predicting anti-dumping protection. When we randomize swing states, uh, we don't, you know, the coefficients are all over. So sometimes you would get, you know, you predict negative protection. So what you really, what is important in, to predict anti-dumping protection is, is really to keep track of the actual, uh, of the states that are actually swing in each term. So it's not because, so if you are, for example, Ohio has been swing several times, but if you, if you randomly say Ohio is swing in a particular term where Ohio is not swing, then you wouldn't be able to get the right level of anti-dumping protection, you know, take into account the industries that are important in Ohio. So it's important, and as I said, to keep track of the time of the changing identity of swing states. Okay, so let me now move on. So what I've done you know, so far is to uh, hopefully convince you that our instrument uh, exploits you know, pre-sample ex anti-dumping experience and time varying in political importance of industry coming from swing state politics. And now with this instrument, we are going to study the effects of protection along supply chains. So the main regression results are gonna be, you know, the dependent variable is going to be the growth rate of employment in a downstream industry J. And the key control variable of instrument is gonna be the change in input protection uh, as instrumented by our ID. So this is gonna be the change in our ID. So we are running this regression in differences uh, in order so that, so that here, when you put this uh, industry fixed effects, you're really accounting for industry trends. 
So for example, the degree to which sector J is declining or the extent to which it is being automated. So this is accounted by this SIG4 uh, fixed effect since this is a regression in differences. And we also have term fixed effects which account for macroeconomic conditions and or political condition, whether this is a term in which, you know, you have Bush versus Obama versus Trump. So when you run this regression, so the key coefficient of interest is going to be this beta one coefficient. And, and what you, in the main, the baseline regression, let's just focus on column one, which is our baseline, is uh, looking at the effects of average input protection on uh, the growth or changes in input protection and how they affect the growth rate of employment in downstream industries. So what the baseline, you know, this, this column one implies is that a one percentage point increase in input tariff decreases the annual growth rate of employment by 0.32% uh, percent, or percentage point, sorry. And, and actually uh, our estimates, if you, if you if you look at the, the, in terms of standard deviation, our estimates explain 16% of the actual standard deviation in employment growth. If an interesting thing that I want to show you is not so much the first stage, which is, you know, works is very powerful and is no surprise because I showed you, we do a very good job at predicting anti-dumping protection. But if you don't, if you reproduce the same table, but you run OLS rather than two stage least squares, so you ignore the endogeneity of trade policy, the, you would conclude that, you know, the, the input protection has hardly any effect on downstream performance. The coefficient is always negative, but only significant in one of the specifications. And the coefficient is also much smaller than in our baseline. So this is in line with the arguments I made at the beginning that here we are ignoring a series of omitted variables like lobbying by downstream producers or productivity shock of foreign suppliers they would bias the coefficient upwards, making it harder to identify the negative effect of input protection on downstream uh, performance. So uh, we also use, so our, this regression is very similar to the regression that Asimoglu et al. run, but they are interested not so in the effects on employment, not of protection, changes in protection against China, but in their regressions, the key, uh, the key variable of interest is, of course, trade with China, changes in import penetration from China. But what we do is use this, you know, run a similar counterfactual exercise to what they run to compute the counterfactual, the number of counterfactual jobs lost due to uh, protection against China. And when we apply the counterfactual exercise to our setting based on our, you know, column one of the previous table, we, we get that over this long time period of eight presidential terms, uh, protection against China accounts for 1.8 million jobs lost in downstream sectors, meaning that there would have been 1.8 million jobs more had it not been for protection against China. When you look at it, the, you know, the effects across industries, what you see is that the biggest losers, so the, the sectors that were most affected by input protection, by protection against China, were, were not so much in manufacturing. So manufacturing downstream industry were negatively affected, but the larger losses were actually in non-manufacturing sectors and non-tradable sector like construction. They rely, however, on tradable uh, inputs like steel. So if you look at construction, for example, our baseline estimates imply a counterfactual uh, loss of 150, actually more than 150,000 jobs, they would have, the construction would have, there would have been more than 150,000 jobs more in construction had it not been for protection on key inputs, in particular steel, that protection, protection use, uh, construction uses. So what, one of the things that come out very strongly from our analysis is that the losses, if you want to account for the losses of protection along supply chains, you shouldn't restrict your analysis to manufacturing industries, downstream industry like cars or bicycles in the example we had at the beginning. You should zoom out to 
construction, restaurants, hospitals, these are all large employers that rely on manufacturing inputs that are often protected and, and many of the oh, large losses are experienced by these non-manufacturing industries. Um, okay, let's go back quickly to the diagonal. So what I showed you now was, so our Bayesian results are focused on the effects of protection on downstream industries. What about the protected industries? Well, identifying or isolating the effects on, pro, you know, on protected industries is hard because what you, so what we did here is to look at the effects of tariffs, so changes in tariffs on changes in employment in the protected industry. And what you find is a non-significant coefficient. And the reason is there you have clearly measurement error because within a sick for industry, you have both producers that are benefiting from protection and downstream producers that actually use inputs in that industry uh, and therefore are hurt by, so you have this offsetting effects. And this is due to the fact that we have, you know, anti-dumping is at the level of product and here we are aggregating at SIG4 and within a SIG4 industry, you cannot separate, isolate, you know, the, the producers who are benefiting from anti-dumping protection and those who are hurt because this is an, actually an input. Again, because of the importance of the diagonal. This, this um, specification here is the specification in which in our input tariff measure, we include the diagonal. So this is, in, if you want, the net negative effect, effect of protection, taking into account both protected and downstream uh, sectors. And here, as you see, this coefficient is actually very similar to our baseline. So if you do a counterfactual, you do again get a loss in terms of overall net job losses of around 1.7, 1.8 million jobs. So this is the, if you want the net effect when you see, once you include the diagonal. We are now doing a lot. So this is, as I mentioned, an ongoing because we are doing a lot of work, including looking not only downstream, so you know, from steel to cars or bicycle or construction, but also upstream. So looking at whether there are any effects for, uh, you know, for industries that are vertically related, but not downstream, but rather upstream. So this is, you know, following a discussion we had with Kalina Manova, and we are in the process of doing that. We are also, as I mentioned, trying to rewrite our instrument as a separate shift share instrument. So clearly, making it clear that there is you know, a political shock, which is the changing identity of swing states every president after every presidential election and the heterogeneous exposure across industries. So that is something we are currently doing. We are also, we have collected very detailed level uh, on subsidies, uh, both federal and state level subsidies to include those as, a, as additional controls in our regressions. Uh, Partly because you may worry that you know some of the effects we are capturing could be due to other policies other than anti-dumping or trade policies that are used to favor key industry or important industry in swing state. But there are more, many more. So, for example, this is you know our two-stage least square regression, but now with different uh, measures of anti-dumping, not the average input duty, but you know looking at product coverage, import coverage, again, going beyond anti-dumping and including countervailing duties, including countries other than China targeted by US protection. So maybe, you know, in the discussion at the end, we can go back to some of these uh, robustness. So let me, now, since I have little time, let me just say we have, and we will continue updating as the data becomes become available, to you know, including measures of uh, protection under Trump. Uh, this is for the, includes the first two years of Trump. So when you take and combine, here our preferred specification is column three, which combines anti-dumping protection under Trump, as well as the special section 301 and other tariffs introduced by Trump. Our estimates imply that during the Trump presidency, the two years of Trump presidency, around half a million jobs were lost in downstream industry due to protection against China. So this is, you know, uh, clearly more than the average job losses in, in under previous presidency. But anyway, um, 
what we want to point out is that, uh, you know, the world, they were already, you know, downstream industry were already suffering from protection well before Trump. Uh, in terms of other outcomes, so if you go beyond employment, and here you're restricted to the CS uh, manufacturing, you know, CS, NBR database, so only manufacturing downstream industries, uh, then you, you do see that in terms of employment, it is blue collar jobs that are uh, affected by protection. So it's more the blue collar jobs that are uh, the ones uh, suffering. And then there's negative effects on wages, sales and investment. Uh, in terms of mechanism, we show, as you would expect, uh, that uh, imports, so the first two columns are about imports. So imports from China uh, of targeted products, products targeted by anti-dumping protection are clearly significantly reduced. So tariffs, you know, again, these are all two-stage V-square repression. So we're using our instrument to look at the effects of tariffs on imports of targeted products, and these are negative. Even if you look at beyond China and look at the top 50 exporters, you see that, so you allow for the possibility that you, you know, of trade diversion and of, you know, US producers switching from uh, Chinese to other uh, suppliers, then what you see is it's still a very negative, you know, neg negative effects on imports from China, and we don't find any significant evidence of trade diversion, at least in our data. And prices are, which are the key reasons why, you know, downstream producers would be hurt by protection, are increasing both domestic prices, this is PPI, and this is all input. So this is data from, uh, again, the MBR, which combines information of imported inputs and domestic inputs. So protection increases uh, the prices of protected inputs. In the, so independently of whether you source from China or from domestic suppliers, the cost of production will, for you as a downstream industry, will increase as a result of protection. Uh, okay, so let me conclude so that we can have time for a discussion. So this is basically a summary uh, of the main contributions of our paper. So we put forward a new instrument for anti-dumping protection, which exploits exogenous variation in the political importance of industry resulting from swing state politics and in their historical experience in anti-dumping. And then use, we use this instrument to study the effects of protection along supply chains. And you know, our baseline estimates show that anti-dumping protection does hurt downstream producers in line with the quotes I gave you at the beginning or other quotes like uh, this one from the FT. Uh, maybe of interest to some people in Geneva, uh, and particularly those that are the WTO, what I think our paper more generally shows is that anti-dumping is clearly a very political kind of trade policy. It's not only the most widely used, but it's, just, you know, there are clearly political economy motives for this type of uh, trade measure. And there is a big debate in the literature on, you know, the, on the rationale. So anti-dumping duties uh, are allowed under WTO, GATT WTO rules, and there's a big debate on why they're allowed. So there are papers that, like these two AER papers that have uh, put forward or have emphasized an economic rationale for anti-dumping protection, but there are also uh, other work by Bagwell and Steger that provides a political economy rationale for, anti for allowing anti-dumping protection within the GAD WTO. Our paper clearly shows that politics affects or is, is very important in explaining variation in anti-dumping protection and that anti-dumping duties are used as a very flexible way to favor industries that are politically important. And in a way, our analysis can help to explain statements like this statement of the former USTR general counsel who was arguing that basically one of the key reasons why the US has not been uh, nominating new appellate body members and has been, you know, putting uh, the appellate body at the deadlock is uh, that uh, the US has been quite upset with the way the appellate body has ruled on many anti-dumping cases involving the US, Trump, you know, not understanding how politically sensitive anti-dumping is 
for the US. And I think these, you know, our paper clearly shows that anti dumping is indeed political sensitive. And in fact, our instrument builds precisely on the political sensitivity of anti dumping. So let me stop here so that we can, we can have a, a, a broad discussion. So thank you, Paula, for your super clear presentation. Uh, we have five minutes for the, for the Q&A. Uh, there is a question from Marcelo. So, uh, Marcelo. Hi, Paola. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Axel. It was a pleasure to, to, to listen to you. The, the, um, so I'm, I'm on the 180,000 workers. Um, um, so two points. The first one is on the 180,000 workers. You mean 1.8 million workers, right? Million, million, sorry. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Uruguay. I always see things, uh, things a little bit small. So <laughs> the 180 million workers, you are, you are forgetting that that anti-dumping duty may be creating jobs in the, in the industry upstream. And I think that's something that Kalina was suggesting you look at. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, so we are going to do that next. I mean, uh, right now, Lorenzo is recreating the measure, looking at the input output linkages you know, upstream. So we are going to, I probably, when I present it in Paris, at the Paris Free Workshop, which is in a few weeks, we'll have all the results looking upstream. But I don't expect that they, you know, protecting, already you see that when you look at the effects on the protected industry, which are hard to, you know, you, you have a non-significant effect. So I don't expect, but we'll see, that, you know, protecting steel or chemicals will lead to large, uh, employment gains in, in industries that are upstream, you know, nice. from those. But we'll see. What we have looked so far is, is indeed downstream or downstream plus protected industry when you include the diagonal. And there you get around 1.8 okay. million net job losses. But indeed, there could be some positive effects in terms of a growth rate of employment in upstream. And that I'll be able to tell you. Sure. And then the, so another suggestion very quickly, because Monica is going to kill me, is that you may want, if you relax the assumption that the, the, the small country assumption for the US and, and whatever happens in the US industries, you're affecting well prices, then it's not only the, the next downstream industry that gets affected, it's the one after that also. So you can go from steels to cars to the transport sector. Oh, okay, but then we are already doing. First of all, we are not assuming that the okay. US know anything about war prices. In fact, the main thing I show you, you know, US prices are affected. That's all you, all the methods for our results is that, you know, anti-dumping protection of China raises the price of protected input of targeted products, therefore raising production costs for uh, US downstream producers. Right. It doesn't, you know, we're not looking at war prices, but more importantly, when it comes to the, let me just show you one thing about total, the, the, all the input up linkages, when you do total coefficient, sorry, I'm going in the wrong way. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I need to go to the robustness check. So there is already one of the many robustness checks we have run. Sorry. Okay, here it is. Uh, vertical linkages. So you see here total requirements. Here we are looking at how steel affects construction and construction affect cars. Or we are looking at all the vertical linkages, direct and indirect, by looking at total. And there, you that's you know, yep. you know, we may actually decide to put this as a baseline. You know, we are still, uh, but in any case, the the effects are. So we already have. Uh, you know, uh, robustness showing that, you know, you still get significant and sizable negative effects downstream if you account for direct and indirect linkages. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't see any raised hand uh, right now. So uh, there, is, there was a, during your presentation, there was a question that we didn't get uh, to relay from uh, Giuseppe de Arcangelis. And he was, uh, he was asking related to your, um, instrumental variable, whether you distinguish between first terms and second terms? Uh, we did uh, look at that and we found no difference, which I was a bit surprised, frankly, but in a way it's maybe not so surprising because, so first of all, we always control for term fixed effects. So in a way, our, in our regression, we control for whether we are looking at first or second term, but we thought maybe we get a stronger, we can predict 
you know, our instrument is stronger for first term when the president can still be reelected and is not a lame duck. But we found that the instrument was equally powerful. And in a way, maybe this is not inconsistent with what we find with the ITC votes in the sense that if you think about the politics, it's not so much the president's the president that directly affects at least ITC votes, maybe the DOC is more under the direct impact of the president, the Department of Commerce, but ITC commissioners, the six guys that decide vote on anti-dumping injury, these are in direct contact with congressmen who want, you know, who are playing swing state politics and are influencing uh, these commissioners because they, they are the ones who appoint them, who set their budget, so there are many reasons, you know, many channels to which Congress, these key congressmen in charge of trade policy can affect ITC. So if you think about, it's not the president that, you know, it would be different if you think about, like in my previous paper with Lorenzo and others, we have looked at trade disputes and how swing state politics affect the initiation of disputes by the US. And there clearly we find strong uh, re-election motive. So we found that the first term, you know, was a big effect. So the presidents initiate disputes much more in their first term and particularly initiate disputes that are helping industry that are important in swing state. But this, you know, initiation of trade disputes is something that the president can control directly. Obama can start, you know, uh, started just before his re-election a case against China on uh, Chinese auto parts subsidy. So you, you can do that and benefit from it. In the case of anti-dumping, it's more congressmen, in particular the finance and ways and means that influence commission. So whether it's the first or second term should matter less. And indeed that's what we find. You know, we, we can predict anti-dumping protection both in first and second term. Okay, so we are out of time. So thanks again, Paola, for your uh, super interesting presentation. Thanks, Axel. Thank you, for, uh, thank you very much. And feel free, Marcelo and everyone else, to, to get back to me. I'm happy to have you know, bilateral conversations. And, and there are some, there, in the last few minutes, there were some new questions in the Q&A that popped up. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have uh, time to address them now, but we will pass but them uh, to Paola. Uh, yes, please. Yes, yes, that's so, very helpful. Thanks, okay, everyone, thanks, for participating. Yeah. thanks bye -bye. everyone for participating and just bye. one last thing. Uh, see you again on the 31st of uh, May when we will be hosting Nathan Anna. Okay, so thanks everyone. Bye. bye. Thank you.